So the topic is trust biopsy, does it still have a role? And I think that's really the question that's on everyone's mind. Uh, we're facing shifting winds in terms of technology, uh, and I think it offers a very valuable opportunity to appraise where does trust biopsy still fit in our clinical practice and in a research, research setting. So it's undeniable that prostate biopsy has historically represented the single most valuable platform for obtaining pretreatment prognostic information. Quite frankly, that's where we get everything from. We get Gleason score, tumor volume, uh, PSA density, volume measurement. So it's really been a very robust and critical element of for how we assign risk in prostate cancer. However, it's also unquestionable that the standard template biopsy and that's what I'll use to refer as trust biopsy, represents a source of persistent disease mischaracterization and a source of biopsy-related complications. So I want to pull back a step and ask a larger question, or, or collectively ask a larger question. What are our expectations from a biopsy? What can we possibly expect a biopsy to do for us? What trade-offs are we willing to accept for simplicity, cost, cancer detection, and morbidity. Uh, there's probably a spectrum. There are probably ways to biopsy and sample the prostate that give us more refined clinical information, uh, but there are considerations of cost, uh, the amount of the degree of difficulty in performing it, and, and I think that's what we're struggling with as a community. So the new generation of refined sampling strategies has unquestionably emerged that attempt to overcome the limitations of trust biopsy. And so the question exists, Will systematic trust biopsy, standard trust, stand the test of time? So our overview for this morning, we want to define what can trust biopsy do, what can't trust biopsy do? How can we improve on what we have? And how can we build on trust as a platform for improving the way that we do biopsy? Setting the stage for MR fusion biopsy uh, and also laying a foundation for some of the work in transperineal mapping biopsy. Just to begin, the rationale for systematic trust biopsy. So by its nature, we know that prostate cancer is a multifocal disease. Systematic biopsy of the peripheral zone represents a simple, relatively easy means to sample the prostate in one setting. And so, you know, I think this is the earliest reference I could find from JAMA in 1953 of a, of a Fanzler operating rectal speculum and biopsy forceps. So this is really the most crude, rudimentary way of doing a biopsy. Essentially, they would dilate the rectum and just take blunt pieces of the prostate out. So we've come clearly a long way since then, but, uh, but this was the initial recognition that we need to sample multiple areas of the prostate. Extended sampling schemes have improved sequentially. Uh, this is a meta-analysis of, of almost 21,000 patients from 87 studies demonstrating a consistent improvement in diagnostic yield with more cores added. So going from six to 12 cores, we see uh, a significant benefit in the, in the detection of cancer. There's probably diminishing returns above 12, um, but there's always been, you know, historically been a challenge in, a, in apprising exactly what the yield is, because these studies are not really anchored to a gold standard prostatectomy or mapping biopsy. So that's why I think we can gain a, a lot of valuable information in looking at the recently published PROMISE trial. And so this was a very uh, well-received trial published in Lancet in the end of January. And I want to take it from a different angle and not really focus so much on the MRI findings, but to look what this tells us about the diagnostic abilities of TRUSS. So what they did is they recruited patients with a clinical suspicion of prostate cancer due to elevated PSA, digital rectal examination, or family history. They had a multiparametric MRI, and all patients underwent truss biopsy and at the same sitting, a transperineal mapping biopsy, which really stood as the gold standard. So this was really a way to cross-reference and correlate how well the MRI was at delineating where significant prostate cancer was, and we defined significant prostate cancer as Gleason pattern 4 plus 3 or larger tumor core length, 6 millimeters or above. So this really offered a perfect head-to-head -head comparison and gives us, I think, probably the best insight on, patient, on, on how well systematic trust biopsy performs. So 
it indicates, unsurprisingly, that trust lacks sensitivity. So it was 48% sensitive for detecting clinically significant prostate cancer. That's not very good. Um, it was quite specific, uh, and the positive predictive value is pretty good, which is probably not surprising. Um, I'll defer the MRI conversation for our, our colleagues coming up, but MRI was more accurate than trust. Unsurprisingly, it had a sensitivity of 93%. So I think this is probably our best estimate at where trust systematic biopsy sits in terms of sensitivity for detecting clinically significant prostate cancer. We can also use trust biopsy as a staging modality at the same time. It's highly, highly operator dependent, and I want to emphasize that, but in very, very skilled hands, and there's probably just a few people across the country who are really reliably still doing this, uh, it can represent a, a robust predictor of final tumor stage. Uh, this is data from UCSF from Katsuro Shinohara, who really is an expert sonographer. Uh, and in his hands, trust outperformed any other clinical parameter in predicting T3 disease at radical prostatectomy. Because of this robust, consistent experience, trust also gives us really tremendous insight into the biology of prostate cancer. So. There's a tremendous interest in, in evaluating prostate cancer on surveillance using serial imaging. However, we're always shifting the modality that we use. 1.5 T magnets to 3 T magnets might not be uh, comparable. But at UCSF, Dr. Shinohara has been doing essentially the same uh, B-mode truss for over 15 years sequentially at very, very tight six-month intervals for patients on surveillance. And this is just a, a cardinal example here of a patient who was diagnosed with uh, Gleason 3.3, had T1C disease on digital rectal examination, and on trust there was no lesion. Uh, at six-month intervals, he was evaluated with trust and, bega and began to develop a hypoechoic lesion in the left mid and left base, which was biopsied and found to be Gleason pattern 3 plus 4. So we looked at this data to see how anatomic ultrasound during prostate cancer active surveillance changed over time. So just as we might want to anticipate how an MRI might change, we wanted to look if any progression on trust would be indicative of grade progression or, uh, or any progression. And actually, any progression on trust was an independent risk factor for uh, grade progression. Uh, any change in lesion volume or number of lesion sites also were predictive. If we look at how patients do over time, uh, the clinical stage at diagnosis assessed by trust was significantly predictive of outcome on surveillance. So patients who were T2 had a higher risk of progressing, progressing on grade uh, during surveillance. And on multivariable analysis, progressing on imaging was significantly associated with experiencing Gleason grade outcome, uh, Gleason grade upgrade and treatment eventually on surveillance. But we can't be too sanguine about trust because we know there are certainly limitations. And I want to say that biopsy problems really fundamentally are prostate cancer problems. We can't really detach the two because they really coexist. So if we look at the 2012 U.S. Preventative Service Task Force Statement Grade D Recommendation, the language that they used fundamentally were two points. The harm is related to treatment of screening detected cancers, and we can probably do something about that. But the, really, the harm is also related to screening and diagnostic procedures. So they were I th really speaking about the harms associated with biopsy. So just, you know, I, I think these are all very well known to us, but to look systematically at, at what these harms really are, uh, this is a recent systematic literature review by Stacy Loeb uh, in collaboration with other colleagues looking at uh, in the literature rates of hematuria, rectal bleeding, hematospermia, and infections. I think we're becoming much more attentive to these numbers. Hematuria almost in a quarter of patients, rectal bleeding bothersome only in 2.5 percent of patients, and a variable rate of, of infection from 0.5 to 6 percent. Who's at risk for post biopsy infection? This is data from the ERSPC screening trial, looking at over 10,000 prostate biopsies, there was a 4.2% uh, rate of, infection, of, fe of febrile infection and less than 1% rate of uh, infection requiring hospitalization. So the significant risk factors for developing infection, prostate size greater, greater than 40 cc's, and being diabetic.
In addition to infection, there is a real significant risk of undersampling associated with, pro with prostate biopsy. This is data from Johns Hopkins looking at over 7,600 totally embedded radical prostatectomy specimens, and they looked at their corresponding needle biopsies as well. So 36.3% of patients were upgraded from needle biopsy to radical prostatectomy. And that discordance in staging has frequently been cited as a reason to not do surveillance or to, to be treated with early stage disease because we can't really be certain what's truly in the prostate. But that mischaracterization also cuts both ways. So we are undergrading, but, in, but we're also potentially overgrading. So almost a quarter of patients who were biopsy Gleason 3-4 were actually downgraded to 3-3 three, three, uh, when looking at the entire specimen. So I think that that's also a quite a significant consideration that we might be mischaracterizing both undergrading and overgrading prostate cancer using uh, truss biopsy. The false negative rate is considerable, and that reflects the, the poor sensitivity of truss biopsy on a systematic approach. Uh, despite the use of extended biopsy templates, that false negative rate still is in the, in the range of 16 to 41 percent, depending what data you look at. And when you look in aggregate at how many biopsies we're actually doing over a million a year, uh, that becomes quite significant. This is data from the PLCO trial looking at the natural history after a negative biopsy. So 43% of patients who have a negative biopsy undergo a second biopsy, uh, and only of which 10% are positive. And it's even lower if their initial indication was an abnormal DRE. So that's pretty significant. So that's one biopsy and then a second biopsy in a negative setting. I think a third consideration is that, uh, that our systematic quote-unquote approach is not always quite so systematic. And this was really a very interesting study from Hopkins uh, where they wanted to assess how reliable and how accurate uh, a urologist is at sampling the prostate. And they simply wanted to measure the discordance between where you thought you were going to systematically approach the, the peripheral zone and where you actually put your needle. So they assessed the accuracy of freehand systematic truss biopsy. They were actually doing this to validate the use of a robot to help systematize how the biopsy was performed, but it gave us a lot of insight into the targeting errors, accuracy, and precision on a repeat biopsy. So those little green points here represent how a perfect, system, truly systematic approach would be. And the red spheres represent where we actually put our needle. So you can see it's, we're not really a, performing a truly systematic biopsy. There's a lot of clustering laterally, uh, but it doesn't really uh, capitulate the entire story here. And when you, when you look at, at accuracy, which is defined at, at, by the rate at which we resample the same area twice when we want to, it's even more poor. So those spheres are really very poorly aligned with each other. And so, uh, the, so there's actually the range is 23.6 millimeters that we, that we deviate when we try to hit the same spot. So we go very far from the gold standard systematic approach here. And as another consideration, and I believe this was uh, cited by Dr. Klotz yesterday, is that prostate cancer is multifocal, and that has implications not only for Gleason grading, but also for how we, uh, also for the, the genomic and uh, molecular complexity of the tumors that we find. So not only do we undergrade, but we appear to, to find different gene signatures. So this was a very sophisticated, elegant study, only looking at four patients. And they, they took four patients who had radical prostatectomy at Roswell Park, and they did next-gen, really deep sequencing on these patients. And they took, essentially, non-contiguous prostate cancer foci, um, and they sequenced them, and they looked at somatic mutations, copy number alterations, gene expression, gene fusion, and phylogeny maps. I think for simplicity, we highlight just looking at some of the conventional gene expression tests here. Uh, and each, so each of those numbers, uh, CAP001002, represent different patients. And the bars represent what those, those gene expression levels are, depending on which site you sampled. So sometimes they go up and sometimes they go down. So this really calls into, the question, calls into question the extent of which tumor heterogeneity is, uh, is an issue. Uh, of is an issue and reflects biopsy missampling. So how can we improve on what we have to not throw the baby out with the bathwater? 
One, I think, big improvement is the use of targeted antimicrobial prophylaxis. And just as a poll, does anyone, is anyone doing rectal swabs routinely before biopsy? We've begun doing that where we're doing a rectal swab routinely, sending it for culture, uh, and treating it with a targeted agent. Uh, so if they're, so Cipro is our default, that falls within our, uh, within our uh, microbiome, with our, uh, our infection microbiome. Um, but if someone has something that's outside of that, resistant to fluoroquinolones, we will treat them appropriately. And this is data from Northwestern looking at a single institution, 457 patients undergoing a biopsy, um, and 112 patients underwent a rectal swab prior, and 345 did not. So there were nine rates of sepsis, nine patients with sepsis who, in, the, in the group that did not have rectal swab prior who just got antibiotics, and no infections in the, in the group that had a rectal swab. Um, and in 20% of those patients who had a rectal swab, they changed the antibiotic that were given. So not only can that lead to a decreased risk of complications, there's a cost savings in averting one septic episode of about $4,500. Because biopsies are uncomfortable, there's been an interest as well in pharmacotherapy and efforts to, to reduce the, the burden of, of, of biopsy. This was a study looking at 10 milligram of diazepam showing no correlation with pain response measured. So probably routine diazepam is not going to make a big difference, but there, I know some people still do it. There are probably some patients who it does benefit, um, but, but not routinely. And lastly, um, there are measures to actually improve the localization within ultrasound itself. Ultrasound elastography, for example, is one of those techniques which really tries to measure tissue elasticity. Uh, and the premise is that stiffer tissue uh, is, is probably more, is reflective of a malignant state, reflecting higher cell density. However, there are practical challenges in distinguishing among benign stiff alterations, such as fibrosis or inflammation, uh, so it has not really been a robust predictor of high-grade disease. This is a study of al almost 300 patients who were randomized to receive systematic biopsy or elastography-directed biopsy. So there was a higher cancer detection rate uh, using elastography, but it did not stratify according to grade of disease. So you weren't finding higher-grade cancers, you were finding more cancer overall. So perhaps the best biopsy is no biopsy. And so we've, we've heard some great talks so far about new biomarkers that are sort of uh, coming through the pipeline to avoid or to offer better stratification of risk before the time of biopsy. And this is one I wanted to highlight uh, looking at that is a urinary exosomal signature. Um, it essentially measures expression levels of PCA3 and ERG RNA in urine. It does not require DRE. It outperformed all of the other uh, PS, all of the other clinical calculations uh, in terms of predicting high-grade disease. So, at a cut point of 15.6, which is uh, uh, a clinical score that they use, we could prevent 27 percent of biopsy with avoiding very few primary pattern four, uh, and so it has a negative predictive value of 91.3 percent. There's also an interest in decreasing repeat biopsy. Uh, there has a, a long been a commercially available methylation-specific assay, uh, which looks at the methylation status of three genes in residual histologically negative cancer tissue. So what we're trying to do here is zoom in on the patients, the, who are the 40 percent of patients who are being considered for repeat biopsy following an initial negative biopsy. So by assessing the methylation status of these three genes in the histologically negative tissue, uh, this assay has a negative predictive value of 88 to 8 to 90 percent, and is really the most, and, and clinically is the most significant predictor of subsequent biopsy outcome. So moving in a different direction, and, and I think we're, I'm going to try to dovetail into the next two talks. Uh, what, how can we improve on what we have? Transperineal biopsy holds promise. It avoids needs and concerns of co-registration, and also avoids a transrectal approach, which addresses the issue of infection. Uh, Dr. Stone has made contributions into that, to the, the question of needle deflection, which might reflect some of that sampling issues we, we've seen with systematic biopsy uh, to a needle that has no deflection when it's fired. The MRI revolution is here. 3 tree prostate MR imaging allows for the detection of prostate cancer. The addition of multiple parameters improves the predictive performance of MRI at diagnosis.
uh, and improves the resolution of conventionally undersampled regions at systematic biopsy. So this was really a, the landmark paper published in JAMA in 2015, the data from the NCI, over 1,000 patients, showing that targeted biopsy led to a 30% uh, higher detection of high-risk prostate cancer uh, and 17% less uh, clinically insignificant disease. So, you know, this is where we started. This is the uh, 1953 report of an operating speculum and, and biopsy forceps. We've moved to trust biopsy, and uh, perhaps the next iteration uh, is really towards a more targeted, image-directed approach. So in conclusion, trust certainly has a role. It's not going anywhere. Maybe it's getting a makeover, and the next two speakers can talk more about that. But systematic biopsy has represented the singular source of clinical risk assessment in prostate cancer. There are well-characterized uh, limitations, including biopsy undersampling and oversampling, uh, procedural complications that present truly broader implications that threaten early detection practices, and we need to be cognizant and sensitive to that. Uh, there are efforts to minimize infectious complications and procedural discomfort, uh, and we're using this platform to, to integrate new and improve biopsy platforms. So thank you very much.